This is Tracy Castellon, and uh, I work for Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, I'm in the research branch, and we are engaged with a um, we're engaged with a status assessment for the diamondback terrapin. Um, this is very much a um, joint effort with our partners. Um, we are working with essentially everyone who is interested in diamondback terrapins in the state of Florida. Um, and so I will acknowledge those people to the extent that I can. Um, assessing diamondback terrapins is, in Florida is important because we have significant regional responsibility for the species. Um, we have about 20% of the species range because of the long linear um, extent of the Florida coast. We also have five of seven subspecies and three of those are endemic. Um, in Florida, we use the IUCN red list criteria um, for all of our assessments. And so this project will focus on those criteria that are most likely to be triggered by um, the diamondback terrapin. Um, those include a look at the geographic range reduction, population, um, small populations or restricted populations, um, population size reductions, and then declining trends. Also, uh, one could look at the quantitative analysis of population models, but at this time we just don't have enough data to do that. So we're hoping to move into that kind of analysis later and uh, once we have more data, but right now we're focusing on the others. And so our research plan essentially follows the IUCN criteria. So our first criterion is to obtain uh, sighting data to map the current distribution. Um, that will help us determine if there's evidence for a range reduction. Um, we're also looking at uh, developing a, a habitat model using those uh, citation, uh, excuse me, those sightings. Um, we're collecting tissue samples and conducting a genetic analysis which will help to validate the subspecies classifications because um, meeting those IUCN criteria is very much related to the population that you apply them to um, and we are also estimating effective population size and isolation where those issues are important for conservation status. Um, we're also conducting uh, mark recapture studies um, and we're working with partners who are collecting their own data. We are estimating uh, population declines based on uh, past and predicted habitat losses and degradation because there's very little um, trend data on terrapins in Florida. And so uh, we have to um, look at habitat loss kind of as a proxy for population losses. I'm going to present the methods and the progress to date together because this is still very much an ongoing project and I think it'll make more sense to present it that way. So the first criterion that we looked at is the range reduction. Um, we collected over 10,000 sightings from our partners statewide. Um, the red lines indicate where we know um, terrapins are currently distributed. Um, these are sightings from the year 2000 and onward. Um, the historic data are the yellow lines and I, this doesn't indicate an actual range expansion. It's just that we had very little data before this project. So in short, it looks like there's no reason to expect a, um, a range reduction. Um, that doesn't mean that there haven't been populations that have winked out. They probably have, um, but for the time being, there's no indication uh, that this criterion for listing or for uh, conservation status is going to be met. Um, now, the population size and trend criterion relates primarily to very small and isolated populations. As I mentioned, we have uh, five subspecies in Florida. The Mississippi diamondback terrapin, which is here in 
just reaches its eastern extreme in Florida. The ornate diamondback terrapin that covers most of the Gulf Coast, the mangrove terrapin in South Florida. Um, there's this is a very uncertain boundary. There may be uh, it may be that the population of mangrove terrapins is limited to the far southern keys. The East Coast terrapin covers most of the East Coast, and then we have the break with the Carolina terrapin that extends further north of Florida. So if this criterion is met, it would probably be for the Mississippi diamondback terrapin because it has such a small range in Florida. And then possibly for the mangrove terrapin, um, if it is in fact limited to the Southern Keys. But as I kind of hinted, um, we're not 100% certain about the classification of these subspecies. There's evidence that, um, that the species may be oversplit. Um, their recent genetic data don't support that level of differentiation. And in fact, the very most recent um, paper by Kristen Hart suggests that these four subspecies are probably uh, should be combined into a single management unit. Um, but those, those studies were done based on a limited geographic um, coverage of data and then there were microsatellite studies so they had limited um, genetic coverage. So what's needed to really um, address this question is a larger, more geographically extensive coverage and um, using next generation um, genetic techniques. So that's the next part of our study is um, we've partnered with some genuine um, geneticists, Brad Schaefer, who's a world renowned turtle geneticist and uh, his colleague, Peter Scott. And this project will uh, assess the current and recognized subspecies um, with the goal of um, combining some of them if that's warranted and then identifying any truly genetically distinct management units. We're also estimating effective population sizes um, because that will inform some of our statewide assessments. And we're measuring genetic isolation where that's important for conservation, particularly in the lower keys um, where that population may be uh, extremely isolated. Um, the methods we'll be using are whole genome sequencing and RAD sequencing. We'll use whole genome sequencing for the subspecies question and then um, population genetics will be, I'm sorry, yes, whole genome sequences for the subspecies question and then RAD sequencing for the population genetics. So that those together will be the most exhaustive uh, molecular approach that's currently available. Um, we want to do this in a way that's very defensible because it may be controversial. Uh, we want to use a method that will identify any genuine differences um, that can be used to conserve the subspecies. Um, these are the data we've collected so far in terms of uh, genetic tissue samples. We've collected over a thousand samples in Florida and we have pretty good um, coverage geographically. There are some areas that uh, where we don't have good coverage that are important because they are at the boundaries of subspecies. So we really would like to fill those gaps. Um, we're reaching out to people. If you uh, are, are aware of anyone who has samples from these areas or could point us in the direction of a surefire place to get turtles, we would very much like to fill those gaps. Um, for our range-wide genetic samples, this is what we have so far. We have some big gaps here. We had plans this season working with partners to fill those gaps, but because um, of the coronavirus, a lot of people are on travel restrictions and a lot of people haven't been in the field. So we will be scrambling in the next year to try and fill these gaps. If anyone can help with that, please do reach out to us. These are the areas where we have um, population, we have enough samples to run population level genetics. 
the red circles are places where that work is complete and the yellow circles are places where it's ongoing but where we anticipate having enough samples. These are the areas, um, aside from the genetic work, we're doing actual in the field uh, mark recapture and monitoring studies. The yellow circles are the, the places where Florida Fish and Wildlife has conducted studies, um, mark recapture studies. And then the red circles are all of our partners who are uh, sharing data with us throughout the state of Florida. And this is very, very helpful. We're going to know a lot more about um, the status of diamondback terrapins in the state of Florida when this is finished. So these, all these data are going to be um, informing the population size reduction criteria. We don't have a lot of trend data in Florida. All that we have in terms of direct observation so far are um, Kristen Hart's data on the Western Everglades. Um, she has seen a recent crash in her long-term monitoring site. In the Central East Coast, Seagull monitored a population that was fairly robust in the 80s and then found um, when he revisited in the 90s that it, it had essentially crashed. They're still present, but at very low um, abundance. We have our two study areas uh, in South Florida where we are following up and resurveying the same locations that were surveyed by Brian Mealy and his colleagues um, over a period from uh, the mid 90s to 2010. So we should be able to identify trend data uh, trends there if they exist. And then we have a partner in North Florida who's been monitoring a, an important nesting site for uh, well over a decade and we should be able to find trends there. Where we don't have trend data, we're looking at habitat loss um, from urbanization, coastal development, shoreline hardening, and also accounting for sea level rise. This will allow us to predict uh, into the future whether we anticipate um, triggering the IUCN criteria based on habitat loss. So that uh, concludes my presentation. Um, we are still seeking partnerships and in particular related to tissue sampling um, and uh, especially from people outside the state of Florida. So please do get in contact with us if, if you have any suggestions on how we might fill those gaps because this is something I think that's going to be uh, beneficial to um, Diamondback Terrapin conservation um, range-wide and uh, I'd like to thank our partners. There's too many to list individually, but uh, you know who you are and we very, very much appreciate your efforts. Um, this is, uh, I'm more of a, a puppet master and um, most of the work, most of the on the ground work is coming from our partners and we appreciate it. And with that, I'll close and I'll take any questions. All right. Is where did you get your funding for genetic work? Is it through the state? It's a state wildlife grant, so it's federal money that comes to the state and then the state distributes it um, based on a, a proposal process. Second question is, are you located at the Gainesville Research Lab? Uh, I am located in my upstairs bedroom in Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, my lab is the Gainesville lab. And I think those two may have been it. Thank you very much, Tracy. Thank you.